Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Addressing ACEs in Schools, Trauma-Sensitive Strategies. This is our sixth webinar in the Let's Fix School Discipline webinar series, um, which is a deeper dive into the How We Can Fix School Discipline toolkits. The toolkits arose out of um, community members and educators wanting strategies for moving away from suspensions and expulsions. And so today we're going to do a deeper dive into the trauma sensitive portion of the toolkits. The toolkits are also available for educators and community members from fixschooldiscipline.org backslash toolkits. And today I have with me Dr. Joyce Dorado and Jane Stevens. Take it away, Jane. How common are adverse childhood experiences in school children? And how does childhood adversity affect their academic performance and health in schools? Uh, next slide, please, Joyce. So Chris used the CDC's ACE study as a model, and a little bit about that. The ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, looked at 17,000 people in San Diego who were all members of Casa Permanente. And long story short, it determined a direct link between childhood trauma, this list that's up there that you can see, and the adult onset of chronic disease, uh, mental health issues, and social health issues. It also discovered that the more types of ACEs a person had, the higher their risk was for chronic disease, mental illness, and social health issues. Um, including violence and uh, ending up in prison. So at the end of this presentation, there's a slide with a link to an article about the ACE study so you can learn more about it. But I just want to um, go over real quickly that the 10 types of childhood adversity that were looked at in that study uh, were physical, sexual, and verbal abuse, physical, emotional, and, and emotional neglect, essentially the five usual suspects, and then five types of family dysfunction. A parent who's an alcoholic or addicted to some other type of drugs or diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, witnessing a mother who experiences abuse. Losing a parent to an abandonment or divorce. And a family member in prison. Now there are, of course, other types of Child, adverse childhood experiences, such as living in a violent neighborhood or in a war zone, or even witnessing siblings being abused, but the ACE study just measured 10. And it, uh, its first publication was in 1998, but they're still following these 17,000 people, so they've had more than 60 publications over the last um, 15 years or so. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, thanks. So um, in Chris's study, he found essentially similar results. Um, even at, at a young age, 45% of the students had experienced one or more of these 10 severe and chronic types of adversity, and 12% had three or more, uh, which means there's a lot going on in that kid's life that that child is bringing into the classroom. Next slide, please. So Chris found that the level of ACEs exposure was the principal predictor of a child's attendance and behavior problems. Um, that is, for a lot of teachers, is sort of a no-duh, but uh, then he took it further and even figuring in other risk factors, ACE exposure was the second most powerful predictor of a child's academic failure. The first was if a child was in special education classes. And as we know, a lot of kids end up in special ed because of their behavior problems in, in classrooms. Um, so he was actually going to be looking into uh, average child experience in special education and trying to um, suss that, that piece of it out. So Chris and his team have worked with Lincoln High School in Walla Walla, Washington, and six elementary schools in Spokane to transition them to becoming trauma-informed. This year they've expanded to 20 more schools, including two in Seattle. And at the end of this presentation, there's a list of stories I've done about trauma-informed, also called trauma-sensitive schools. 
And later today, I'll be adding a story about one of the elementary schools that Joyce has worked with. And now I'll turn it back to Sarah. Oh, sorry, I forgot the takeaways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I guess. Um, so obviously the takeaways are that childhood adversity is pervasive at very high levels, almost everywhere we look, says Chris, even in public schools ten attended by middle class kids. Because the ACE study was done on mostly white middle class and upper middle class uh, people in San Diego um, who have um, uh, who are college educated and all have good jobs. And other subsequent ACE studies have, have shown that there are even higher ACEs, uh, ACE scores in populations in inner cities that, um, that don't have all the same advantages. And by the way, 21 states have done ACE studies also um, in the last uh, five years. The second takeaway is because so many children with adversities attend schools, schools themselves are affected, and schools uh, themselves may be one of the major contributors to childhood trauma, especially if they create environments where fighting and bullying are common. Let's go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Joyce Dorado to talk about complex trauma in the developing student brain. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just want to let you know I'm a little bit sick of a bad cold, so I don't normally sound like this, and I will occasionally mute myself if I need to cough, so you don't need to listen to that. Um, I also can't, as I'm presenting, I won't be able to see your chats, so that will, we'll look at that at the very end. Um, I work at San Francisco General Hospital. I'm a, the director of uh, UCSF Healthy Environments and uh, Healthy Environments in Response to Trauma in Schools. I've been here for about 14 years working with traumatized uh, kids and families for more than 20 years. And uh, so my, my job in this uh, webinar is not to try to make you therapists or counselors, but really to try to lend a stress and trauma lens to your expertise as educators so that you can be doing your jobs more effectively um, with uh, kids who've experienced trauma and you can stay well in the process. <clears throat> so um, as uh, Jane already mentioned, these are the kinds of childhood trauma uh, that Often our kids uh, that come to our shelf at least uh, have experienced more than three, at least on average three uh, of these different kinds of trauma um, with many, many events within them. You'll recognize that these are, you know, when we talk about ACEs and childhood trauma, it's really the same thing. This is just a, a larger list than what ACEs, uh, the ACEs study include. So in specific, I'm talking about complex trauma, um, which is, um, sort of early chronic trauma, multiple traumas that often happen early in life and that often occur within the caregiving system, that very social environment that in the healthiest of circumstances is supposed to be a source of safety and stability and nurturance in a child's life. And when it's complex trauma versus say a one-time trauma, that tends to have much wider reaching um, effects than, for example, simply PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I don't want to be coming from a deficit model here. I really want to say very clearly that kids can, many of us actually probably in this webinar have experienced adverse childhood experiences or trauma. What you see here are a number of people who um, grew up under very adverse circumstances, but then went on to change the world. And you may recognize some of these people, um, but from left to right at the top, that's Barack Obama, who doesn't describe his experience so much as trauma, but he did lose a couple of caregivers over the course of his life, he was separated from them. We have Gloria Steinem, we have uh, Eve Ensler, we have Tina Turner, where would we be without her music? Down at the bottom, we have Maya Angelou, John Lennon, um, Oprah Winfrey, and Bill Clinton, who experienced a great deal of um, exposure to domestic violence in his family. Um, so all of these people were able to recover and to be resilient and to make big contributions to the world. So I just want to say that why we do this work is we don't want to lose any of our kids to trauma. We want, to, we want to make sure that they all make it, and not only that, they're valuable to us because they're going to be able to contribute to our universe in big or small ways, and because, because there are people that we love. So um, the other thing I want to say is that we can talk about trauma, but I also want to widen the lens even to stress, that we all undergo um, stress throughout our lives. We, um, I don't know how many of you could even say you have not experienced any stress in the past week. 
Um, so this is not just about traumatized people. This is about all of us. What you see here is um, the York Dodson law. If you, the bottom x axis is um, is uh, the stress arousal level from low to high, and the the y axis, the vertical axis, is performance from low to high. And what you'll see is that all of us, when we're at a certain arousal level, not that kind, but the stress arousal level, um, there's an optimal level of of stress arousal that. And you know when you're in it because you're clicking along, you're doing your work, you're being really efficient. The problem is that if you up that stress arousal level, we start to get anxious, we start to get less um, good at what we're doing. And then if you really push that stress arousal level to high for any of us, not just people who are traumatized, we can lose access to knowledge and skills that we otherwise have. And, um, and so you may all be able to relate to this on some level in terms of where you are on your stress arousal level and how often you are at that very high stress arousal level. We start to talk about that as toxic stress if it's sort of chronic, unremitting, um, high levels of stress. So really stress and trauma is a public health issue. Um, we know now that stress is linked to the six leading causes of death, chronic stress that is. Um, we also know that it doesn't tend to be just this person there or that person they, over there. There's often in our, for example, in our um, schools in the southeast sector of San Francisco, there's a fairly high density of kids who've experienced trauma. And that those kids, when, for example, they have a meltdown in class or have a big reaction in class, they affect other classmates, they affect the teacher. There's a ripple effect to others. Um, and we also know that um, many of our communities are disproportionately affected by things like racism and classism and urban poverty. And when you mix that with trauma, it's a very toxic brew. Again, I do want to say that in our even most heavily affected communities, there's a great deal of resilience. Um, and within, from within their empowerment, but they are frequently quite disproportionately affected by these things. We know that um, there's, for a lot of our uh, kids that come to school, there's often a multi-generational history of trauma. It's not just them, but it's their parents, their aunties, their uncles, their brothers. Um, Jane did a great job of just reviewing the Adverse Childhood Experience, a study that has very serious health effects in adulthood. So really, um, just sending these kids to therapy is not going to do it. We need to have a systemic preventive approach. We know that unaddressed trauma is, effect, is, um, is uh, associated with uh, lower school performance, higher absences, difficulties with executive functioning that you need for learning, difficulties in self-regulation that is very um, tied and correlated with academic achievement, lower grade point average. So what do I mean by trauma? So trauma, uh, as defined by SAMHSA, <clears throat> is uh, the event plus the experience of the person who's experiencing the event plus the effect. So the event can either be an actual harm or an th extreme threat of harm. And then what happens is that for all of us, for any of us that are under threat, we go into fight, flight, or freeze. In our bodies, we experience, if we experience terror or horror or pain. And then what's toxic, potentially, is that if we get sort of that big arousal, stress arousal level, and then we can't escape. So those feelings um, can overwhelm, then, our brain and our bodies. Um, we then, the effect of that can be sort of a disintegration of different parts of our brain, as we'll discuss, and a dysregulation, meaning sort of a loss of control of, of our sort of internal states, our behavior, our emotions. And over time, that can have very lasting adverse effects. Again, there are some people who experience trauma who can be resilient in, front, um, in the face of it, but oftentimes this is what can happen. So just to paint a picture of this, I'm going to read a very quick vignette. So Carlos is a 10th grade boy who arrives in his high school 45 minutes late. When his teacher asks him to go to the dean's office because he's so late, Carlos looks at his teacher, says nothing, and sits down at his desk. The teacher stops teaching and asks Carlos again to go to the dean's office. That's the procedure. When Carlos looks down, he shakes his head, um, starts cursing under his breath. The teacher becomes frustrated. She raises her voice and says, I told you to get out of here and go to the dean. At this point, Carlos stands up abruptly, knocking over his chair. He begins yelling and cursing at his teacher. A startled female student cries out. Carlos's classmate approaches him, saying, back up, bro. Carlos shouts at his classmate, pushes him away roughly, knocking him down. Carlos's teacher calls the office for help. Carlos is removed from the classroom by security, and then he is suspended for five days. It may sound familiar to you. It's certainly familiar to the teachers that we talk with. So we might ask the question, if one is really stressed out, what is wrong with Carlos? This might engender a certain kind of a feeling that then will engender a certain kind of response. 
And someone who's watching the classroom might ask the question, what is wrong with this teacher? Again, might engender certain feelings and then engender certain kinds of response to her behavior in response to Carlos. Um, and the, the difficulty is when we simply sit with those questions, what is wrong, and those kinds of feelings of fear, anger, frustration that come up, it can, unaddressed trauma can absolutely feed what is being known as the cradle to prison pipeline or the school to prison pipeline. We know from research that unaddressed trauma is related to a higher risk of school dropout. In San Francisco Unified, there's a huge disproportionality in terms of um, students of color that drop out versus student, not students of color. We know that dropping out of school increases the risk of being imprisoned. And here's the statistic that I find incredibly heartbreaking. This comes out of the Children's, Health, Children's Defense Fund. <clears throat> One in three of our African-American boys born in 2001 has a chance of being imprisoned in his lifetime and one in six of our Latino boys. The statistics are not a little bit better for girls, but still very disproportionate. These are our brothers, our sons, our kids, and we can't afford to lose any one of them. So really, addressing trauma is also about increasing equity in our systems. So how do we change the trajectory for students like Carlos? And how do we provide support to teachers so that they can be effective educators while well, staying well, well in the process? So if you take away nothing else from this training, I'd like you to take away this slide, which is we all, a trauma-informed system helps us to shift our perspective. Can we change the paradigm for when we see an aggravating thing happening in front of us, instead of asking ourselves or the person, what is wrong with you? We shift that to asking, what has happened to you? And when we ask that question, what it allows for, it provides a context for the behavior, it fosters compassion, and it actually also helps us see strengths in the face of adversity. For example, even in this vignette, Carlos is at school. He's sitting down. He wants to learn. He doesn't want to leave. How do we foster that strength? The teacher's hanging in there. He's, she's trying to get him to do the right thing. How do we foster that strength? So let's just ask the question, what has happened to this teacher? Is Carlos in here somewhere? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm going to go with this one first. What has happened to Carlos? Um, so what we know about Carlos, um, is that he lives in a very um, a neighborhood where there's a lot of, uh, of violence. Uh, he has been growing up uh, being exposed to domestic violence between his parents. Um, the previous night there was a terrible um, uh, event where uh, his mom was beat up so badly by his dad that the uh, neighbor called the police. They took the police, uh, the, his dad away in handcuffs. His mom the next morning um, just wouldn't get out of bed. So where was Carlos? He was bringing his little siblings to their schools, and that's why he was late. If we had allowed ourselves to ask what has happened to Carlos, we would see where he's coming from, and we would be able to respond more effectively. So now let's ask the question, what has happened to his teacher? Um, so his teacher, um, had they just had a school lockdown the previous week. She's really on high alert. She um, is a fairly new teacher. She just received a pink slip. Um, and so she's stressed out, generally speaking, about her job. Um, there's been a lot of fighting in her classroom and kids getting hurt. And so she's, again, on very high alert. She's got um, achievement testing coming up and is under a lot of pressure for that. And so she, what I'm saying is that both of these people bring those previous stressors to this interaction. And um, they're, they're acting as though they're under threat from all of those there and then experiences. And that has escalated the situation. So a little bit about <clears throat> the neurobiology of trauma. Um, so really put very simply, trauma wears a groove in the developing brain. So the metaphor I use is a 20th century metaphor. I'm hoping that most of you remember uh, what vinyl records look like. There's a picture in case you need uh, your memory refreshed. But back in the olden days, you actually put a needle on the record. And if you play the record, you play a song you know, 5,000 times. Say it's, you know, since 1970s, I love Led Zeppelin, I play Stairway to Heaven 5,000 times. It literally wears a groove in the record. So now I could be playing a different song in that record. Somebody actually bumps the table, and the needle skips across the record and lands in that deepest groove, even if that's not where I meant to be. And then when I, we get to the end of the song, if the groove is deep enough, I don't get out of that groove. I don't, um, I don't move into the next song. So that's all fine if um, the song is your favorite song, potentially. But what if it's the trauma group? What if it's the fear song? So 
And we get knocked into that even when something isn't actually a threat. So what is the fear song? What does that trauma group look like? Well, um, what it looks like is uh, hypervigilance, looking for threat-related cues, increased muscle tone, a focus on, um, on like, what's going to happen, anxiety, behavioral impulsivity. These are all fabulous things to have on board if you are actually under attack. They're actually terrible things to have on board if you're trying to learn math. So what happens, another way of putting it, is that if the alarm trigger has been triggered over and over and over again by chronic threat, uh, the alarm is now on a hair trigger and people go into alarm, fight, flight, or freeze, even when it's not an actual threat and then there's just a threat reminder. So um, this is a very simplistic picture of the brain. And what we know from brain science is that for people, Okay. So if you look at this brain, the thinking learning brain is in that front part of your brain. Um, it's responsible for um, contextualized rational thinking. It's what we need to have on board when we're learning. The lower part of the brain, the limbic system, is sort of the survival <coughs> emotion brain. Excuse me, I'm taking a little drink here. And what we know from the research and the science, um, brain science, is that for people who've been chronically traumatized, when they are reminded of their, um, of their trauma by a trigger, their frontal lobe largely goes offline and the survival brain, the limit system, takes over. So a way to think about this in um, much more simple terms, if you think of that frontal lobe as the learning brain, the rider that can, um, sort of sitting up high, can make informed, rational decisions, and you think of the, the survival brain as the horse that can be very strong, has protective instincts based on feelings, what happens um, when we are triggered, um, our rider falls off our horse. And so when you have a situation like that and you've got a student where their rider has fallen off the horse, they're under the desk, they're screaming, no amount of star charts, consequences, I'm going to call your mother, is going to help in that minute. What's really important is that everybody work to help get that rider back on that student's horse. And by the way, this happens to us as grown-ups, too, that our riders can fall off of our horses. And can we notice if that's happening and make sure we're not responding simply out of survival and emotional brain? So what are the common triggers? I've used that word a lot. Very common triggers in schools is unpredictability and transitions. There are so many transitions that happen during the school day, and that feeling of what's going to happen next can be a real trauma reminder. You know, at home, the door slams, and I don't know which daddy I'm going to get, the nice find happy daddy or the scary violent daddy. Yeah. So um, sudden change, loss of control, feeling vulnerable or rejected, sensory overload, um, sometimes even those um, assemblies that can be so exciting and fun can be too much for some of our, our kids if we don't provide them with scaffolding. Um, embarrassment or shame, confrontation, and here's the kicker, praise, intimacy, positive attention can at times be a trigger if that's a trauma reminder for many of our children um, and youth who've been sexually abused, sometimes that's what happened right before the bad thing happened. So these are the kinds of things that can knock a kid rider off of their horse. So what are some strategies for addressing student trauma? First of all, I just really want to make clear that a trauma-sensitive approach isn't just good for students. It's, an, it's good for all of us. Um, it, it creates a, safe, a more safe and supportive school to promote learning readiness, equity, growth, and resilience for everyone in the school community, grown-ups included. And any safe and supportive trauma-sensitive school is going to need to attend to the wellness of school staff because this work is really hard. And how we don't get our riders knocked off our horses and our stress, you know, sort of maxing out to their red zone all the time is that if we're attending to our wellness and there are organizational as well as self-care strategies for that. So here's a key strategy and another thing, if you take away nothing else from this um, webinar, please remember this. Aggravating behavior is a cause for cause. It's a phrase that came from one of my um, educator friends who's just wonderful. When something is happening in front of you that is potentially um, aggravating, confusing, can you ask yourself what has happened to this person, what has happened to you, and what is happening here? When you take a pause and you ask that question, it, it immediately engages you into that frontal lobe functioning instead of just the survival emotional brain functioning and helps you respond more effectively. Again, this is not just for kids who are experiencing trauma. What we know is that behavior has meaning. And so we're asking ourselves, what need is this behavior communicating? What is the healthy intention behind this behavior? What's contributing to this behavior? So with Carlos, 
when he sat down instead of leaving, what was his healthy intention behind that behavior? Maybe it's that he doesn't want to leave the classroom. He wants to learn. How do we feed that healthy intention instead of simply um, punishing him for um, being out of line in this particular way that, um, that he wants? That applies to kids and to adults. Um, I also like to use the, um, the uh, Example, if you've got a kid who's right up in your face going, teacher, 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 and waving their hands, not impressively, but just right up there, we might ask ourselves, you know, what is happening here? What's the um, need underneath this behavior? Some people might say this kid is looking for attention. That's true, maybe. But if you go a little bit deeper, maybe what that kid is looking for is connection. Isn't that healthy, that a, that a student wants to have connection with his teacher? How do we provide that connection and that relationship in a way so that this unskillful means of getting attention and connection will start to go down instead of just extinguishing the uh, service behavior. So <clears throat> when we talk about sort of key strategies for transforming trauma in schools, um, we're going to talk here very briefly about uh, establishing safety, eliminating threats and reducing triggers, um, making the environment more predictable. We're going to talk about fostering uh, strong, supportive relationships with caring adults and also between school staff. And we're going to talk about building skills in managing emotions and thinking clearly because these are the kinds of things that can get knocked, the, those, the, the development of the ability to manage one's emotions and think clearly can get knocked off course by trauma. So let's talk about safety first. So what we know is that students cannot shift, upshift from survival brain to learning brain if they don't feel safe. And that's really true for all of us. So physical safety um, is around really protecting kids from harm. Jane mentioned, you know, bullying, those kinds of things, um, abuses of power need to be um, addressed. Um, if a kid is being hurt at home, there needs to be ways to protect that kid. Clear safety procedures that everybody knows if there's some sort of lockdown, a reduction of unnecessary triggers, and even something as simple as keeping posted schedules having a school-wide positive behavior support system so that the environment is predictable, not just in kindergarten, but all the way through high school. Because those kinds of routines and consistency and then explicit preparation for changes in transition help everyone in the building feel more safe and um, that it's a stable environment. We also want to build emotional safety and internal safety by making sure we're building self-regulation and emotion management skills. And we want to make sure that we're creating relational and social safety, um, and we're going to talk more about that. So you may recognize this. This is um, behavioral response to intervention. Um, and I just want to say that trauma-sensitive um, approaches are absolutely congruent with behavioral RTI. As long as what we do as we look at these supports is make sure that they're not unnecessarily um, escalating and that they are augmented so that they build skills that kids may not be coming to the table um, with, uh, given their age, as that we would expect them to have given their age. Um, so again, the predictable environment, really working and focusing and spending time on fostering a healthy school climate. This school-wide PBIS, um, again, works for most of the kids. And that, again, creates a much more stable environment and a safe and supportive environment with the um, the caveat that students with lagging skills may need a differential approach. But fair, really, equity is not about everyone getting the same thing. Fairness, equity is about everyone getting what they need to do their best. So <clears throat> one of the classroom strategies that we teach within HEARTS is using regular brain breaks um, in the classroom. Again, most of you who are teachers know about this. Um, but it helps to maintain calm in the learning environment. It also gives kids practice with things that can help them calm down because every time you practice something that's that neurobiology sort of gets stronger and we can access it even when we start to get anxious and stressed out so belly breathing is one of the things that we've taught to all of the kids who are at our heart schools and we can say let's all take a belly breath and everybody knows what that is um, physical activity stretches um, sort of self massage tactile grounding with sort of squeezy things and um, and music during transitions, these are all things that should be universal supports for everybody so that everyone can, um, can practice those skills. Having uh, clean drinking water available is very important. So then, if there is a crisis, um, 
that there are a number of de-escalation sort of trainings that, that maybe people should have. We at the district use um, uh, a CPI, which I believe means the Crisis Prevention Institute uh, training. It's a sort of nonviolent de-escalation, very um, congruent with trauma-sensitive practices. Um, and then afterwards, it's very important to be employing things um, that can help reintegrate a kid like Carlos back into the classroom. We can't just pretend like nothing happened. Unfortunately, that's what happens to kids at home when they're um, experiencing trauma. As people are like pretending as though nothing is happening, so that can be very re-triggering for other people as well. So after a kid is calm, after everybody's rider is back on their horse, and that may be minutes, hours, days later, to be able to facilitate a discussion with a student to understand what happened and what might be needed to avoid future escalation. This helps to integrate the thinking brain with that emotional brain. It helps build problem-solving skills. Restorative practices is a wonderful approach to this. Um, for those of you um, who don't know, we'll talk about it very briefly, but it's all about restoring relationships that might have been ruptured because of some sort of harm that has been um, done. So the, just a little tiny taste of this. You can read more about this at the um, International Institute for Restorative Practices website. Um, this is the model that SFUSD is using. When you think about this, again, the sort of x-axis is support and empathy from low to high. The y-axis is, um, is sort of control and structure from low to high. And what we're asking people to aim for is that with box, the warm demander. Those are the, being able to hold kids to high expectations while at the same time providing them with a lot of support. So again, lest you think that what I'm saying is just be nice to kids and just be in that four box, that's really not what I'm saying. I am saying let's move away from that. Let's move away from um, the punitive approaches and let's try to move towards that with box and not just for our students, but with each other. So <clears throat> here's a little bit of research for you around uh, resiliency. Uh, we know that resiliency is really highly correlated with um, a strong relationship with a, a adult in a mentoring role. Those people that I showed you with early on that were resilient in the face of a lot of adverse circumstances, most of those really will talk about somebody who really was there for them. We know that one of the strongest predictors of academic success is the student's perception of, what well, does my teacher like me? We know that um, emotionally warm, sensitive teachers have students that have higher growth in math and reading. And here's what's super important from a stress and trauma lens is that positive teacher-student relationships are particularly important for students that have self-regulation and attentional difficulties. These are often our kids that have experienced a lot of early chronic trauma because those are the kinds of things that can get affected. <clears throat> so, let me just get all of these slides up. <clears throat> so, what, what I want to say about healthy relationships very briefly is that we are all hardwired for connection. What you see there is the vagal nervous system. You don't have to understand the whole thing, but no, but only mammals have it. We need it in order to um, take care of our young. It's a basic need we needed as much as food and water. And we're hardwired so that healthy relationships um, that, that, that involve attunement, um, being someone who's sensitive and responsive to our feelings and needs, those attuned relationships help us feel safe and calm when we're stressed out. That, that vagal nervous system operates through the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system in our bodies. That's the break in our systems that help us calm down after we've been stressed out. Yeah? So there's neurobiological reasons um, for this. The problem is that complex trauma can interfere with the development of self-regulation because in the healthiest of circumstances, um, babies and young kids get what we call co-regulation from their caregivers. When they're stressed out, they help them calm down viscerally through their bodies, through their voices, you know, rocking, patting, those kinds of things. And it can create an excruciating dilemma, and I'm sorry, when we have, in the healthiest of circumstances, that helps kids develop their own self-regulation skills. But there's a real dilemma when those um, caregivers are actually the cause of trauma or they're not available because of their own trauma. They can't provide those sorts of co-regulation skills. It, it derails those self-regulation, um, uh, the development of those self-regulation skills. And then <clears throat> it can affect our relationships, so we may have students who might be overly clingy or dependent. They push us away. They don't know that, how to make use of us as helpful others, which can be really hard for us that got into this business because we want to help. So can we not take it personally? Can we wonder if maybe instead of this, this kid hates me, maybe 
he's afraid. He's afraid that if I let he lets me help him, I'm just going to leave him. I'm just going to help him. Can we be aware of if a kid is pushing our buttons? Attend to those really intense feelings. Make sure we're practicing self care. We're talking with our colleagues, with people who can support us, so that we don't inadvertently escalate these kids and push them. So I think what I'm trying to say here is we can talk about big eye interventions, like trauma focused CBT, even RTI. But really, um, what kids get hundreds of a day is little eye interactions. This is from my colleague Sandra Gershep, and um, that every time we have a positive attuned interaction with a student, we are helping to rewire their brain. It is absolutely possible to rewire kids' brains so that they can make use of helpful adults, so that they can be um, get better at perspective taking, so that they can learn how to um, calm themselves down. And every time we do that, we're helping to rewire the brain. So that's really good news, because we can all contribute with those little eye interactions. And we also need those little eye interactions, too. So again, some of you might be familiar with the statistic around um, we need a 5 to 1 relationship deposits to withdrawals. In other words, for every time you need to redirect or provide some sort of criticism, if you will, to a student, can we find five other times um, to be able to say something positive about, the, about them, it's about their effort. I see that you're working really hard. Thank you for sitting in your seat. Wow, I'm so glad to see you today. They don't all have to happen in the same interaction. We can just build those up over the course of the day. That allows us to build and maintain strong relationships with our kids. Can we not take their behavior personally and wonder if maybe their reaction is about something else? When we try, when we need to um, redirect a kid, can we connect with them, employ their parasympathetic nervous system, the thing that calms them down, that relationship, and then redirect? Can we use things like restorative practices to repair ruptured relationships? It's such a gift. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we yell in class when we don't need when we don't mean to. Can we come back and say, "Listen, I lost my cool. Um, I'm really sorry. Let's try to figure this out and work together to make this better." We want to engage with the students, other caregivers, so that um, the other grown-ups are working together. We want to convey hope and empowerment by highlighting kids' strengths, acknowledging their progress, and not simply focusing on whatever threat they may be. Um, bringing to the classroom or whatever their difficulties are. Um, and we really just in the end want to be able to provide no matter what caring and not, again, not letting kids get away with things, but really saying even things like I'm very frustrated with you, but I am going to work, I'm going to walk beside you and work with you to try to figure this out. So that's about the relationships. That was about safety and then relationships. Now we're going to talk a little bit about managing emotions. When I talk about emotion regulation or affect regulation, I really want to make sure that you understand that I'm not saying tamp those emotions down, control those emotions. What we're really talking about is being able to identify um, what this feeling in my body means in terms of what, what, the, what my emotion is. Um, how do I express these emotions in a way that is safe and that gets the help me the help that I need? And how do I modulate the intensity of my emotional responses so they're important, so they're appropriate to the situation? These are the kinds of things that traumatized students often need to learn and that we can teach through social emotional learning curricula, through our, our modeling the behavior in ourselves, even through read alouds um, when, or you know, history, um, English language, uh, literature, these kinds of things. What we know is that this sort of invisible injury of affect or emotion dysregulation can actually cause behavioral dysregulation, so those difficulties might be being caused by invisible injuries. And so what I want to, the sort of metaphor that I use is Ross Green's metaphor, and I've sort of taken it and ripped on it, so I'll just take a quick look. So he uses a wheelchair ramp metaphor, and what I like to say is, look, say that I've been in a uh, car accident. My legs have been terribly injured. I'm in a wheelchair. If I'm at the bottom of a set of stairs, no amount of star charts, consequences, money, cajoling is going to get me up those stairs. What do I need? I need a wheelchair ramp. I need some scaffolding. I need a tool to get this. So it doesn't mean that I can't get to the top of the stairs. It means that I need tools, scaffolding, support. So most of us would not begrudge the person in a wheelchair a wheelchair ramp. But some of us feel funny when we're providing extra supports, extra in quotes, supports for a kid who has invisible injuries, like emotion regulation difficulties, difficulty making use of helpful others, easily triggered into survival brain. So can we look at it more as trying to address those invisible injuries and provide things like 
you know, again, back to my metaphor, physical therapy, occupational therapy, ways to sort of strengthen my legs so that eventually I can use those stairs again. And can we avoid punishing kids for being in survival brain? <clears throat> so um, building skills, um, what I mean, mean by that, uh, Julian Ford talks about building skills and managing emotions. The second step is a wonderful and evidence-based way to do that. Um, and building skills and thinking clearly. So those kinds of perspective-taking, problem-solving um, skills that, that we all need in order to do well. We all know that so those kinds of social and emotional skills are highly correlated with success in life. Um, so when we do that, it helps to integrate the thinking-learning brain into the emotional brain. This is, we don't need the emotional brain. We just need the thinking brain to be integrated into it. Um, and can we engage our students, scaffold them in making meaningful choices and decisions, because that both gives, empowers them, and these are kids who sometimes have been like, disempowered by trauma, um, and it also helps them build their, um, their thinking skills. So a little bit about affect emotion uh, regulation skills. Those brain breaks that I talked about, really doing those regularly and not just in reaction to stress, but sort of building those, those muscles, if you will, um, those brain muscles. We are giving kids practice modulating their energy from high to low because depending on what the situation is, you need a certain level of energy, like desk work is a different level of energy that you need versus like being in front of a bunch of people and presenting. Right? So um, these are the kinds of, uh, of strategies that we've used and a lot of this um, is in some of the resources that, uh, that we are going to be providing you. If a kid is really sort of riders off their horse, sometimes what they need actually is just sort of to get out of the classroom and just like be out on the yard and just run a little bit. That physical activity is what the body is trying to get them to do when they're in fight or flight. Sometimes that kind of physical activity is what's needed to sort of reset the stress arousal level. Just keeping that in mind that stretches are very helpful in sort of helping people re 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 reset. And then we have these things called peace planners. Um, do we have time to go into this in a little bit of detail, Sarah? Um, I believe we do. We have about um, 10 minutes left um, before questions start. So, yeah, you have time. So, just, yeah, so I'll just go into this one strategy a little bit. Um, we call these things peace corners. It's really a space in the classroom where students can engage in, in self-regulation, calming activities. It's really meant to be a short little stay, five minutes, ten minutes. And the goal is to try to help kids notice when they're starting to, like, get um, stressed out, um, and then take action so that they can calm themselves down. Um, sometimes uh, for older kids, it's just a, a cool down kit. It doesn't have to be a corner. It can be mobile. Here are some of the materials that we use to stop our peace corners. Um, pinwheels so that like that belly breath, which is just taking a deep breath in through your nose, filling your, your belly and then chest with air kind of holding that for a second and then blowing all the air out, all the air out. Um, you can even try that right now. All the way out of your belly and then sort of in through your nose and out through your mouth. So the active ingredient, by the way, in the belly breath is the outblow, the out breath. That is what brings on the parasympathetic nervous system, the thing that calms down our system. So pinwheels can be in those peace corners because if you ask a kid to blow on the pinwheel for as long as they can and make the pinwheel go around as long as they can, that encourages them to do a slow, steady outlook. Um, other kinds of tactile grounding are neurobiologically calming stress balls, a timer so that kids know that they only have a certain amount of time in there. Citrus or lavender is neurobiologically calming, so sometimes we'll put lotion in a cool down kit. Some of our teachers actually keep lotion on their desks and they, they use it themselves. Um, headphones with music so people kids can just sort of unplug for a minute. Um, Bean bag chairs are really great because they sort of help to provide kind of a containing environment without, like almost like a hug, without the threat of a hug. A feelings chart that where kids can circle sort of where they're at in terms of their emotions, and that's also a way for teachers to later come around and check in with them. So a few tips about a Peace Corner. It's very important to establish, um, to have structure around it, to practice using it for one or two weeks. Everybody's teacher, all of the students, so people Kids understand that it's not just for whatever so-called crazy kids. It's for everybody. Really clear routine and structure on entering or on exiting. Try to add one thing to the Peace Corner, the cool down kit at a time. Let everybody use it first so the novelty wears off and only the kids that really need it are using it. 
teacher saying things like, well, I'm feeling a little stressed out right now. I'm just going to use this lotion for a minute. Everybody just take a nice deep breath in through their nose, out through their mouth, just do a belly breath together. Right? So you're modeling how to use it, helping kids establish a signal for when they need to use the peace corner. And really, here's the key. Never using a peace corner as a consequence of punishment. It's not a timeout corner. It's not a punishment corner. You can't say, go to the peace corner, because then, of course, no one will want to use it. Really, it's about kids having a place to practice self-regulation skills, to calm themselves down so they don't have to blow out of the classroom. So just a, <clears throat> a couple of words about the, uh, the program that I run, HEARTS. So this is one example of, a, of a, an approach to sort of trauma-sensitive schools. We have a whole school model um, that, that is multi-level. We do a lot of capacity building with our school staff um, in the schools where we're uh, embedded three or four days a week. Um, but we also provide these kinds of uh, trainings to other schools. We really try to augment their universal supports. We want to lend the stress and trauma lens to folks, expertise as educators, um, <clears throat> so that they're doing their jobs more effectively and staying well in the process. We also um, are provide, we sit on their care team meetings, which in SFUSD is these meetings that happen weekly, where um, special ed, mental health, administration, and some instructional folks, two teachers, come together to talk about kids of concern as well as school-wide issues. Um, we try to help them develop trauma-informed discipline policies. We provide teacher wellness groups to, again, really address teachers. Wellness. And then we also provide on-site therapy um, for kids who've experienced trauma. And that, that therapy is very comprehensive because it also involves intensive consultation with their teachers to try to change the learning environment to make it more safe and supportive for everybody. We will um, consult around IEPs these kinds of things. So we've had, um, we've been running um, HEART since uh, the, uh, the end of 2008, 2009. Um, what we've seen over the course of the years is that at our HEART schools, we've seen a 53% increase in the use of trauma-sensitive practices in the educators at their the schools. Um, we've seen that one of our schools, um, you'll see in the story that Jane is publishing soon, that El, El Dorado, just after the very first year of HEART's implementation at their school, there was a 32% decrease in disciplinary office referrals and a 42% decrease in violent incidents um, of students. Over the course of the years, we've also seen that kids who've, um, who've gotten HEART therapy, there's been a 27% decrease in absences. So we're increasing their school engagement. We're increasing their instructional time, which ultimately is the goal of HEART and all these trauma-sensitive schools is to increase the amount of time spending teaching and learning and decrease the amount of time that needs to be spent around discipline. In these next few slides, and, and if you could click through them um, a, semi slowly, Joyce, um, basically we've included four slides of resources. And um, I know a lot of you are asking about the PowerPoint and if you are going to be able to see it. Um, and I I have, we have included the resources and we've made a PDF and it's actually available if you look on your toolbar you can see materials available for download and there's a PDF of this, um, this uh, toolkit, um, oh, sorry, of this webinar. Um, so as you can see in this, on this slide there are a bunch of resources um, that Joyce and Jane have put together. Um, Maybe that, I can talk through a couple yeah, of them. Yeah, that would be great. And then I, I'm hoping <clears throat> that Jane can too. Yeah, so um, the National Child, Child Traumatic Stress Network is a really terrific resource. I think the main thing that we actually drew from in creating HEARTS um, was uh, from Massachusetts Advocates for Children. Um, there's a book called Helping Traumatized Children Learn, and they just published a second, um, a second uh, book it has much more detail around creating trauma-sensitive schools. It's freely downloadable at this website. If you buy no other book um, that's not freely downloadable, I think Reaching and Teaching Children with Hurt it comes right out of that Helping Traumatized Children Learn um, book. It's sort of an extension of that. Um, it really uses those principles. It has, it's chock full of strategies. It's very easy to read. It's, very, it's text boxed. It text boxes, bullet points. You can just pick it up and read it for a minute and really get something out of it. There's a toolkit put out by the Adolescent um, Health uh, Working Group that is fantastic around trauma. It's, they really try to condense a whole lot of information into very easy to read, usable um, toolkit. Um, if you want to learn more about restorative practices, there's the website. There's something that's come out of Washington State um, that's very uh, comprehensive as well, really downloadable. This is Ross Green. Collaborative problem solving is a very trauma 
it's, it's, it's congruent. He doesn't talk about trauma so much, but it's very congruent with trauma-sensitive practices. Mindfulness is um, there's starting to be a larger and larger, larger and larger evidence, more and more evidence that mindfulness-based approaches can be very helpful around teaching skills, teaching kids the skills they need to um, recover from and do, uh, trauma and do well in school. A number of caveats around using that with traumatized kids that we can talk about in the question and answer section if you like, but there's a resource there. Jane, these are yours. Uh, so ACE's Connection is a community of practice social network for people who are implementing ACE trauma-informed and resilience building practices in schools, communities, hospitals, juvenile justice, you name it. Um, uh, there's somebody doing something in, in this area, in that field. Um, it works a lot like uh, Facebook, but it's got a few more bells and whistles. There are quite a few groups on there, including one on ACEs and, ed and education. Um, ACEs Too High is a new site that covers the research about ACEs, trauma, and resilience, and the people who are implementing practices based on that research. And that's where I post these stories um, uh, that I've been doing over the last couple years about how people are implementing this. And by the way, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but I'm a longtime journalist um, and have had a, a lot of interest in the ACE study since I first learned about it in, um, in 2004. And before that, have been doing a lot of reporting about violence epidemiology. Uh, next slide. And these are some of the stories that I've done specifically about trauma-informed and, uh, and trauma-sensitive schools. Um, plus, there's an article about the CDC's ACE study that I did last year. And um, as I mentioned, uh, I'll be posting a story about um, El Dorado Elementary, which is one of the schools that uses HEARTS, uh, later today. And, um, and then I'll also be posting a story next week about a trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive school system in Brockton, Massachusetts. They've made the commitment to, to have all of their schools be trauma-informed. They also use PBIS, and they see it as a really good fit, good match. And they've done uh, all the elementary schools now are, are trauma-sensitive, and uh, they're beginning to move into the middle and the high schools. And I think actually I want to add to that that um, one of the things that HEARTS has done over the years, we got invited to do a training of trainers with all of the um, school site mental health coordinators and um, health coordinators um, around, uh, around um, trauma and how it affects kids and everybody in the school community and strat trauma sensitive strategies, um, including um, wellness strategies for teachers and other school staff. And so now all of the school social workers in um, San Francisco Unified School District have been trained in this, and they are bringing um, dots, these sort of this model back, um, the sort of concepts and strategies back to their school sites. Um, and the, it, what's been so wonderful about SFUSD is they've also really committed to making sure that trauma awareness is folded into um, the rollout of things like behavioral RTI and restorative practices. <clears throat> and um, and so I just wanted to also include um, the fixschooldiscipline.org because as you know information from all of our partners and when I say partners I mean educators and community members um, as you know important things about what Hearts is doing comes up or what Aces um, has on its site comes up we put that on fixschooldiscipline.org and we have a lot of different contact. Um, different contact information, different contacts and their information. Um, so for instance, restorative justice practitioners and implementers and um, educators who are implementing in their school, we have all of their information on fixschooldiscipline.org. And if you go to the toolkit, um, you can go to the contact section and you see all of these people who are doing different things organized by um, by region, so North, South, Central, California, and then also their um, their um, expertise area is uh, notified on there too. Um, I do want to get to the questions. We have some really good ones, some some very meaty questions. And before I do that, I do want to to point out to everyone because I've gotten a couple more questions about it. But if you look um, at your um, toolbar, 
you should see something that says materials. And after materials, there is a, a parentheses, a one in parentheses. And if you um, expand that section of your toolbar, you can download the PDF um, of this, um, this PowerPoint and it will be hyperlinkable. So um, you can, you know, click on different hyperlinks and they will go to, um, uh, you know, different, uh, the different sites or even open your email um, to send us an email. So I just wanted to point that out. So as for questions, um, the first question, I got a very good question and I think I answered it, but I think that a lot, some other people may have the same question as well. So I'm going to put that out there. Um, it's from um, Larry who um, wanted some more explanation around the comment that schools can be a major contributor to childhood trauma. Um, and I'm hoping that um, uh, Jane can touch on that. Um, I, I, I'll touch on it generally, and I think um, uh, Joyce may even have some more specifics too. There's two major ways. One is in the school discipline policies. A lot of schools still have zero tolerance, and just by um, um, expelling or suspending a student um, um, without asking what Joyce had mentioned, which is what has happened to you rather than what's wrong with you, I think that that can further traumatize, in fact it does further traumatize a kid, and, and the data e even show that uh, by the enforcement of these zero tolerance policies that that kids have been shunted into um, uh, being uh, kicked out of school, uh, disengaging from school, and then of course ending up um, in prison. The other way is the school environment itself. If a school uh, doesn't do much about bullying, um, whether it's from other students or even teachers, then, then students don't feel safe and they are further traumatized or just plain old traumatized. I mean, I think that bullying itself is uh, very traumatic for kids. So in those, in those two ways, the environment as well as the, the, the policies, those two ways can, uh, a school can uh, be set up to traumatize kids. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so also, I, I would say um, that when you have a building full of people who are chronically stressed and or traumatized, and that's not addressed, what can happen is the thing that happens neurobiologically on an individual level gets sort of blown up into the system. So you may have a system that is sort of disintegrated where maybe decisions are being made um, by some without integrating with the rest of the team. Maybe there's scapegoating and finger pointing. It's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. The lack of cohesion, some difficulty around boundaries and disorganization. And when, when an organization like a school is trauma organized, instead of organized around dealing with trauma like as a threat versus trauma informed, where we're taking an understanding of stress and trauma and trying to create a more trauma sensitive um, learning environment. When, when those systems are trauma organized and kids walk into a building and the grown-ups aren't talking to each other or they're yelling at each other or they're finger pointing at each other and they're blaming or people are leaving because they're so burnt out, those are the ways that kids can then get in some ways re-triggered and if you don't, again, if we don't feel safe and supported in our learning environments, it's really hard to upshift into learning brain. One more like, um, quick example, quick illustrative example, at one of our schools, before we, just like in our first week that we were there, there this um, classroom had a green, yellow, red kind of um, system of, uh, you know, positive behavior support in there. So if you're doing well, you're in green, you're not, you know, you get a yellow warning and then you're in the red. Um, and the teacher, very skilled teacher, at some point there was a student who was acting inappropriate, like, and she started to move, she said, okay, Johnny, um, and we use a fake name. I'm going to move your your um, clothes pin down to yellow, and you're going to have a chance to sort of come back up to green. But I'm going to do this. He very appropriate. He started to freak out. He looked at her and was like, "Don't do that! No, don't do that!" And and she 
not a, again, not having that trauma lens, was like, I'm just going to move you down. And, and he, she, she took the clothespin, she started to move it down. He ran up to her and he hit the clothespin out of her hand. Okay, now this kid has had a teacher, big escalation, took a half an hour to calm everybody down. The teacher now feels under threat. Kid um, is, is um, suspended. When we came in um, and worked with this teacher, we asked her, what do you think happened here? And what we, what we came um, to understand is that this was a kid who had a very heavy experience of child abuse. And so when he was in trouble, really bad things happened. So that to the public uh, punishment, if you will, humiliation, just really unhinged him. Does this mean that she should drop her green, yellow, red for the entire class? Of course not. But um, what she did in response to this is she, she made it a more private thing. And then first she focused only on the positives. She worked on developing a positive relationship with this child outside of the classroom. And over time, this kid was able to function much better in the classroom, and she wasn't inadvertently escalating him. So this is just one example of how a very standard procedure can be inadvertently escalating and ways to modify that without having to drop it from the whole classroom. Oh, that's great. And I can add one more, one more thing to that, which is, um, which I've heard at so many schools that I've been to, including um, El Dorado, is if you know the kid's story, if you know that child's story, you have a better idea of how to work with that child. And so um, uh, all the schools that are trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive, they just make a point that everybody, somebody in that school knows, knows um, uh, a kid's story, that there isn't one kid that, that where an adult in that school doesn't know about that, about that child. Right. Um, and so it doesn't, then, by the way, even have to be a huge amount of detail. It can just be what we know about this kid is he's been through some very scary things. And so sometimes he reacts as though a, a scary, threatening thing is happening right now, and we just have to help him figure out how to calm down when it happens, help him feel safe. Okay. Um, so I have another question from um, Maddie. Um, she says, SF Unified School District has engaged for a number of years in quiet time, transcendental meditation in select schools. The benefits in relation to what you've discussed seem obvious. Can you discuss any work you've done with SFUSD and how quiet time helps from a psychological, a physiological perspective, but in particular, what happens over time if a student is not able to continue or chooses to discontinue regular quiet time meditation sessions? Do they revert to the same levels of trauma, assuming conditions remain the same, or does meditation cause some permanent physiological, psychological repair, um, i.e. fill in and smooth out the rut? Very long question. So um, that's a great question. Um, I, I do know that quiet time is being um, implemented, for example, at this Valley Middle School, and they've had wonderful results. The kind of meditation that I tend to advocate for is um, not transcendental, but mindfulness. I think transcendental is great because it's very, it's, it's in some ways easier to do because what you're, you're doing is you're focusing on a mantra, and you're using that, that focus to, to begin to sort of calm your butt brain and body down, and what that does, we know, we know about neurobiology, is that neurons that fire together, wire together. Every time you practice that, it sort of builds up that neurobiology, those neural networks, and that, that helps to rewire the brain. All really great. I think the added uh, bonus of mindfulness meditation, which is really about paying attention here and now with kindness and curiosity, is that it helps kids um, and people learn how to be present with what is. And the thing about trauma is that the problem with it and when people get triggered is they get sort of stuck in a there and then situation instead of actually reacting to what's happening here and now, which may not actually be threatening. It may be somebody trying to help them. And so being able to stay present in the moment helps people stay in the here and now instead of getting stuck there and then. We also know that um, what mindfulness, uh, for example, there's a lot of research around this um, that's up on that website. Um, mindfulness um, sort of builds um, the parts of the brain that are integrative, um, that help to integrate the frontal lobe and the learning brain and all of the different parts of the brain. And um, it, it helps to repair, um, in some ways, that very kind of thing that, that chronic trauma can, can cause some problems with. Again, that integration, that brain integration. Um, we, it strengthens the vagal nervous system. 
Um, and um, the vagal nervous system, again, is very um, important in terms of being able to use connection to calm down, to be able to calm down. So a lot of really wonderful research on it. If people stop doing it, my guess is that the, the connections will get less strong, but you know, you've still rewired the brain in some way. The thing I like about mindfulness um, is that it isn't only meditation. You can mindfully wash your hands and pay attention only to the here and now. You can mindfully walk. There are many things you can do to practice that muscle of staying present in the here and now without judgment, with kindness and curiosity. And so that when, you have a, when you're having an issue and you're feeling like something like, oh my god, I'm never going to be good enough, I'm, un, I'm, I'm unlovable. Instead you, of saying, okay, I'm unlovable, you can say, ah, here's that thought that I'm unlovable. I can now take a step back from it, look around it, walk around it, and notice it's a good thought and it's not necessarily what is actually the reality. So there's a lot of, I think, benefits to mindfulness, um, as well as any practice that helps strengthen the ability to calm down. Okay, and we have another question um, from Nancy. My student has made the choice to sit away from his table groups, and when we have whole group on the carpet, doesn't want to join us. I've allowed him to sit at a different table and sit in a chair at the side of the carpet um, during the whole group time. Is this good, or should I push him to rejoin the carpet group and table groups? Well, I mean, I, I try to stay away from words like good and bad, because really it's, it, it matters what the situation is. What are your goals with this student? Are your goals with this student to help him stay engaged in the classroom? Does he need that kind of scaffolding in order to stay engaged? If so, then maybe that's a good place for him to be, and maybe over time, slowly, 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 you help him reintegrate into the circle. Maybe it's just a minute at a time. Um, and, you know, are you doing this in a way that doesn't feel punitive to this child, that helps him understand that maybe just the way his brain and body works, he works a little bit better when he has a little bit less stimulation around him. So I don't know that it's good or bad. Um, I think ultimately we're trying to hold all of our kids to high behavioral expectations, but we need to provide the scaffolding, a trauma-sensitive lens, and any other kind of lens really would, would say that we need to provide scaffolding so that kids can build the skills so that they can eventually get to that the top of the stairs um, in the way that other people are able to. So, Jane, do you have anything you want to add to that or Sarah? Yeah, I, I think I, I'm going with the same thing. You know, it, it depends on what the goals are for the student. It also depends on what's going on with the student. Um, so um, I think sometimes as a former teacher, I, I remember there was a student who was dealing with, um, he was this, a, a gifted student, but he also was um, uh, a little bit on the spectrum and didn't want to engage. And, and since I, I kind of had to take this, um, uh, you know, so what test, you know, so what if he sits there? Is it bothering the other students? Does it bother me in a certain way? Um, you know, what what can I, you know, I know he's not following this rule where we all need to be in, in circles reading this certain text, but um, if he's able to in, interact in his way, then, then I think I can let this, this go. So kind of thinking about it, again, kind of like Joyce says, not good or bad, but thinking about what are the goals and what am I supposed, you know, what is my educating, um, what is my education function here? Is, is a way to think about it. But of course, you are welcome. If that doesn't fully answer the question, um, you should also um, feel free to touch base with us offline. Um, and our email addresses are um, on this screen right now. Um, I think, think pre-teaching and priming the whole classroom that in this class, um, I'm going to be as fair as possible. But what, what, what we know is that fair is not everybody getting the same thing. There is everybody getting what they need to be successful. So you may find that sometimes I'm doing different right. things with different students, and that's true. That's, that's what differential teaching is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so as long as all of the students really get that, and, and everybody feels that, that that's being also applied to them, that, that can go over much better. Right. Um, then there's a great question about um, the HEARTS program. Is the HEARTS mm -hmm. program looking to expand to other cities where UCSF as a presence. So for instance, Fresno. You know, um, I, I would love to see hearts uh, happening all over the place. It, it is, in the end, entirely a question of resources. 
Um, at this time, we only have the resources to, what's wonderful is that the school district for this school year is actually providing school district money to keep parts going here in San Francisco Unified. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 it's really all about a question of resources. And just to know that, like, this is a process that's been over time, over the course of many years. It's required really developing a great relationship with the school district. A school district that is, you know, if you look on SFUSD's website, you'll see all kinds of things that are very congruent with the trauma-sensitive approach and a real commitment to equity and a real commitment to things like restorative practices that's all very congruent. Um, that may well be happening in Fresno, at which point, um, you, know, look, you know, we should, we should talk. Um, and take a look at those, um, those resources, especially um, the Helping Traumatized Children Learn resources. You may find that there's ways um, that will work in your school district to at least begin this process. But it's, you know, like I said, I think it would be great if every, if every school district had some sort of trauma-sensitive program in your school. Yeah. Um, so Joy has a question. Um, she has concerns about how to impact the paradigm shift needed in administration in order to positively impact the staff as a whole and is wondering about some recommendations about that. So um, I think that's a great question um, because, of course, if you don't have leadership on board, it's much harder to make these kinds of changes. Um, we've been very lucky, and again, in SFUSD, we were really asked by the school superintendent at that time, Carlos Garcia, to come in and help. Um, but, you know, sometimes what I find is that the best point of entry is actually around um, sort of what it's like to be, for example, an administrator in a high-needs school, the kind of stress that that can cause, um, coming at sort of it from a, a wellness perspective of like we need to address the stress, your stress, um, maybe your vicarious or secondary traumatization that can happen if you're working with people who have ex experienced trauma day in, day out, you can start to get some of those very similar symptoms and difficulties, adaptations, if you will to being under threat all the time. And, um, and so when we start there, if I find that people are very open to that and really excited to learn about that because it really hits home. And in that, I sort of tend to try to squeeze in some you know, neurobiology of stress and trauma and, and, then the trauma. and then what people find is that they, they are starting to feel better because they're, they're bringing an understanding of stress and trauma into how they're taking care of themselves. And then they realize that these kinds of practices can actually be helpful for students. So that, I find, is actually a very helpful entry point, as opposed to coming in and saying, this is what you need to do, or, you know, because people already feel super maxed out. Right. Um, and, so, um, what oh, seeing, Jane, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to say there's, there are in, this, in um, several communities that I've looked at, um, it's taken many different approaches. In Spokane, Chris Blodgett and his group, after they did their research, they realized that they really needed to get this out to the community. And they, because they had, they didn't think that just going to the schools alone would, would be enough, they decided to do education for the entire community and see if they get the whole community on board to, to then do a pilot. And in the midst of that, they, they produced this research about what was exactly happening in the Spokane schools. And with those two um, uh, developments, that's when the school system said, okay, let's do this pilot in these six schools. And then because the results were so um, profound, the, uh, they have a, um, a, a kind of a different approach. They have a, an amalgamation of school districts that are kind of together in this northeastern um, group of districts. They are beginning to start now addressing how do we embed this approach in all levels of policy, whether it's in a school, school district, this, this larger group. Um, and I think that, that that worked well for them. In, in Brockton, it was a little different approach. It actually started with the police department that had started learning about um, 
uh, trauma and what happens to the brain and um, uh, in terms of what was happening with the kids who were kind of being ignored in the, in the domestic violence calls that were coming up. And once they realized that it was in this community of 100,000 people, that it was more than 1,000 kids a year that were witnessing this, they needed to do something. So, and, and they asked the question, what is happening with these kids in school then? So that began the, the um, uh, evolution of that community into how can we change things in the police department, now what's available for schools, and that's when Helping Traumatized Children Learn was published, and they, they glommed on to those people and have come to this point of now where the school system said, this is something we're doing the whole district. Now, what Susan Cole will say, and Chris Blodgett will also say, is that if they go into a school and there isn't um, the complete commitment of the principal and at least 80% of the staff and teachers, it's not going to work. Uh, and, um, and that's been borne out in Fresno where they, they have been engaging the safe and civil schools approach. And they started out with a, a group of elementary and some middle schools that, that, who really wanted to do this. And the, they've been meeting a little more resistance with the high schools. So it's taking a little longer there. So it's, um, but in any school, uh, if you don't have the administration on board, they, the Washington Area Health Education Center won't even, won't even go there. And they won't go there if there's just 20 or 30 percent of the teachers on board. They say, we've tried it, it just doesn't work. And so to follow up then on that, um, so Anna had a really good question um, about, well, you know, say a teacher is not in a um, supportive school environment, what strategies do you think the teacher could implement on their own um, in their own classroom? Um, if you, you know, if you want to implement something and, and you're thinking you kind of need trauma sensitive things to do in your class, what are some that you could do on your own if at school, you know, you meet some resistance or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question <clears throat> because it isn't, you know, again, these small, small interactions can make such a huge difference. If you've got regular brain breaks that are, um, that, are that you do in your classroom, on the, that helps kids learn those, those self-regulation skills. If you even just have a, that different frame of um, what, is hap what has happened to you versus what's wrong with you, that will change the way that you respond to your students, and it will it will it will make it so that you will be able to more um, easily um, understand what an effective response might be. Um, peace corners in the classroom is something that that I think is pretty. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's easy on the one hand that you have to do it well or else it's not going to work and all those tips there are like are really relevant. Um, um, really trying to notice if your kids are falling, their riders are falling off their horse and to try to think about what might be triggering them and to try to, you know, be able to have that even that conversation with them depending on how old they are. You know, notice you're getting really stressed out. What stresses you out in my classroom? Um, these are all things that a teacher can absolutely do um, in their in their classrooms, even if the rest of the school is not necessarily on board. And then oftentimes what needs to happen is that if you know one or two or a few teachers in the school start to implement trauma sensitive practices in their classrooms and then the other it sort of catches fire um, with their colleagues. And then so that is another way to go. It is a longer way, it can be much more stressful for the teacher, um, because sometimes people, teachers are feeling like the rest of the school maybe has this kind of punitive way of being in the world, or they're just sort of old school in a certain kind of a way. Um, then kid, their kids are getting triggered outside, but there, there are definitely things that one can do in one's own classroom, even if you don't have a trauma-sensitive whole school approach. Um, yeah, uh, and and that, um, that, that helping, reaching, uh, what is that, Teach, reaching and teaching children who hurt, has a lot of really specific strategies. I really highly recommend that book if you're interested in like things you can do small and large in your classroom. Yeah. 
And I think um, one of our participants actually also talked about um, the, um, you know, like had an answer for Anna about, you know, classroom strategies that restorative justice strategies go very well with this, um, the strategies that um, we uh, talked about today, the trauma-sensitive strategies, and then also um, uh, talked about uh, Ron Clausen's book, Discipline That Restores, um, oh, that nice. also deals with the strategies. Um, and let's see, there's another really good, there was another question. There are a lot of questions, so <laughs> um, let me um, go back. Um, Somebody was uh, asking about um, a child losing a parent because of a parent passing away, either by violence, accident, or natural causes. What research, uh, resources do you have in that area? Um, this person's found that there are, um, there are specialized support groups and camps for grieving children um, and, and, doesn't, um, and is wondering if you have any others, if you know of any for students. Yeah. Um, if you look on the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, um, you'll, you'll see on the website that there's a way to get to types of trauma, and you can look at traumatic loss. That will give you some resources around that. I mean, um, those of us in the trauma field have started to move away from just addressing specific traumas and really understanding that, that for any sort of trauma, there's, there's a certain mechanism that happens in the brain and body um, that will then lead you to a certain kind of response, but there are also very specialty, um, sort of specialized for specific kinds of trauma approaches that are really terrific, and you'll find them on that National Child Traumatic Stress Network website. Yes, and um, there was a question about whether we, um, this webinar will be available to people who were unable to come to this one. Yes, it is being recorded, and in a few days I will, um, it'll be, so it, it takes a couple of days to edit it all together um, and put it in a format that can be uploaded onto YouTube. So um, what we do is upload it and um, put it on our webinar archive on fixschooldiscipline.org um, and I will send all of you an email um, that will have the uh, survey, the link to our webinar archive and this webinar will be at the top. Um, and, um, and then there are also other helpful webinars um, that we've done as well that you can um, see on that page. Um, and I think um, we have... Sarah, I also yeah. just, Sarah, I just want to say that I just emailed you another link to people who want to learn more about hearts. In addition to Jane's story, there's a story that was um, published a couple of years ago that might be helpful in terms of illustrating our approach. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, I'll ask one more. Um, there's one last question, and then I guess we will um, wrap up. Um, and if anyone has any following questions, um, please feel very free to email us. Um, so there's a, um, this question is about a student who, um, when he's sitting at his desk, he will sometimes stand up and wave his hands about and keep shouting out the teacher's name. And uh, she tends to ignore it for a while and then tell him if he wants her attention he needs to raise his hand quietly and wait his turn. Um, and so she's wondering if she should ignore the behavior first or just immediately tell him how he should be trying to get her attention even though he already knows how. So this kid, um, without knowing anything about his history, sounds like he's got some self-regulation difficulties um, and um, that he also clearly wants a connection with his teacher, um, with the teacher understands. And one of the things I might recommend is, in addition to possibly ignoring that behavior or doing whatever you need to do in that moment, um, to finding ways outside of the classroom, I imagine you may have already done this, um, to try to establish um, a relationship with him. With one of our kids in one of our hearts classrooms, one of his difficulties was that when the teacher didn't call on him right away, he immediately felt rejected, and that was a very slippery slope for him into this, his own history of neglect. Um, and so with this teacher actually developed kind of a special signal with this kid. You know, she just tugged on, I can't remember what exactly it was, but say, for example, she tugged on her ear. When he had, was raising his hand and she couldn't get to him right away, she would look at him and tug on her ear. And that special signal that they worked at outside of class was, I hear you, I see that you want me, 
you are, I'm with you, you are in my heart, I care about you, I will be with you as soon as I can. And that really worked very well for this kid. Um, so giving them more skillful means to getting attention but also, um, and connection, but also really developing that relationship outside. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to thank um, Joyce and Jane so, so much for taking time out of their busy days to um, join me on this webinar. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have joined us um, and your really great questions and your yes, engagement throughout. thank you throughout. so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so if you have any follow-up questions, please feel very free to email all of us. Um, you can also call me um, and my my phone number is at the bottom of fixschooldiscipline.org, the home page. Um, and I will be emailing all of you shortly with um, a survey to help us make sure that we're keeping um, everything um, relevant and helpful and also um, uh, a link to the webinar archive page. So thank you so much and everyone have a very good day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.